Welcome back to the Aurelius Podcast. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder and CEO here at Aurelius, and your host for our podcast. Our guest this episode is Peter Morville. He's the president of Semantic Studios and author of several books, including Intertwingled and co-author of The Polar Bear Book, which many of you know is the foundational information architecture book for our field. Peter's also got a new book coming out called Planning for Everything, where he goes into his framework for planning all things in life and how to strike a balance between planning and improvisation in all aspects of your life. We had a chance to chat with him about the book and the topics within, but also a lot about Peter's experience. He's been around our industry for a long time, and being a several times published author, speaker, and practitioner, he shares very timeless wisdom on some things like how to convince stakeholders to do research or more research, as well as systems thinking and how that applies to design. And finally, how to be mindful and self-aware in your work as a designer, researcher, or product leader. As always, it was a wonderful chat, and I think you'll take away insights to apply in your everyday work right away. If you enjoy our chat with Peter, we'd love it for you to leave a rating or review for our show on iTunes. It really helps others find the podcast and get the most out of the great insights our guests have to share. And finally, if you're new to our show, I just want to let you know that our company, Aurelius, has built a user research and insights tool for folks just like you and I, where we help you add, tag, organize, and search all of your research notes and customer feedback so you can make sense of it faster and easier than ever before. You can then create those key insights or nuggets to share with your whole team to make awesome designs, products, and features. We have a 14-day free trial, and we'd love to have you try it out and let us know what you think. Head over to our website, AureliusLab.com, that is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com, or you can find us on Twitter at AureliusLab to sign up. All right, let's get into it with the episode. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 22 with Peter Morville. He is the president of Semantic Studios as well as an information architecture and user experience pioneer. Peter, very warm welcome to the show. I'm real happy to be here. Awesome. Well, let's let's dig right into it. You know, I will have given some folks a little bit of your background and, and sort of, you know, the work that you do, but I think it would be great for them to hear right from you a little bit about what's been on your mind lately and, and what sort of work you've been doing. Well, I took... Uh, about nine months off to write a book called Planning for Everything. Uh, so that's been my focus uh, for a while. I'm just now uh, in the last few weeks getting back into consulting and, and working on a, a pretty gnarly uh, enterprise information architecture project. That sounds gnarly indeed. And it's not something that you are any stranger to. And I would certainly love to come back and hear more about that, but but you've been writing this book, Planning for Everything. What is that all about? Um, so this is my first book where I've tried to write for more of a general audience. My, my stretch goal uh, is that uh, folks will uh, hand this book to their teenager and say, read this book, you need to get better at planning, and that their teenager will actually read and enjoy the book and, uh, and say, hey, that actually did help. Um, so the the approach with the book is is to, is to sort of really kind of go on a tour or a safari <laughs> through the wilds of planning. Uh, my belief is that there is no one right way to plan, um, but that we can all get better. We can develop our our planning skills uh, by better understanding the the the, the um, principles and practices of planning. Okay, sure. Well, you know, I think. I could make some assumptions here, but I'm curious, how did your background, you know, especially your experience and your life uh, in UX and IA lend itself to, to wanting to write such a book? Yeah, so I'll go way back. Um, <clears throat> my parents tell me that when I was in the crib, uh, they would overhear me practicing words um, that they had never heard me say. Um, so I practiced them by myself before I was willing to go public. So I was, I was, you know, part of that's being an introvert, but part of that's being a planner. Uh, so I'm a, you know, I, I'm a sort of a natural born planner. Um, 
And I think that's part of why I've, I've had the career uh, that I have uh, essentially being a professional planner, right? And inf as, you know, information architects, user experience designers, uh, we are helping our clients and colleagues to plan websites and software and products and services uh, that may not be launched, uh, you know, for months or years, and that hopefully will be used many years into the future. Um, you know, that said, I don't consider myself a planning expert. Uh, this was a Th this book, uh, in, in order for me to feel comfortable writing it, I, I, I decided I'm not going to think of myself or present myself as an expert in planning, but really more serve as a tour guide, you know, helping people uh, with an interest to explore the territory of planning. Interesting. Okay. And so where you even started with this a little bit, Peter, is you said that you hope in terms of a general audience, this is something that maybe parents would buy a copy for their teenagers. Uh, I'm curious, I mean, why the focus there? Is that is that very intentional? And if so, why? Um, so partly that it may be due to the fact that we have two teenage daughters. Mm. Uh, one is a planner, one is an improviser. Uh, uh, they both, uh, we see their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and, and it, you know, in thinking about this book one of my goals was for was was for to write a book that would be useful for both planners and improvisers um but i you know i, I i've done some um interviews in, in preparation for the book was sort of part of my research was 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 talking with folks um and i heard i heard from uh, at least one person you know about their frustration with their kid who was going through high school and how they had never really been taught um planning skills and that they were, you know, watching their kids struggle with homework assignments that were, you know, sort of, um, you know, kind of would stretch out over the period of weeks. And there was an expectation that they were planning and moving forward and that they would leave things till the last minute. Um, so I, I, I think of planning as a skill or a literacy that's incredibly important in our lives. And yet we're, we're very rarely taught explicitly. Uh, how to plan. We pick up tips from our parents, from our peers, maybe from our teachers, but uh, we form habits uh, and assumptions early on that, that we often just live with. And so this book is, is sort of intended as an intervention uh, to get people to be a little bit more reflective and, and, and recognize that there are many different ways to plan the way that we learned in, in our, you know, as a, as a kid, uh, it's not necessarily wrong, but there may be ways that we can uh, get better. That's awesome. And I actually really love that rationale for, for targeting teenagers because those are such pivotal years too, uh, for the development of little humans. Uh, mine, you know, my, my son is not quite that old yet, but it is interesting to see some of those parallels and how, you know, seeing uh, life and some of these things unfold through that perspective of a child really does give you, you know, a, a different sense for for when and how these things happen. And interestingly, and I'm sure this has already happened for you several times over, Peter, but I find some of the very things that my son does, who, who's four and a half right now, um, I see some of those very same things and those behaviors in my everyday professional life. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that there's, my guess is that initially this book will be read um, by a lot of folks who are within the user experience community because that's my audience. Uh, uh, th those are the folks who are following me on Twitter and, and so forth. Uh, but, but planning is a skill that is generalizable um, throughout uh, organizations. Uh, and, and so I think that, that there's a lot that can be gained. Uh, uh, there's a lot of suffering that could be avoided, especially in big organizations, if people would just be a little bit more mindful about, uh, uh, you know, planning and recognizing that the way they're doing it isn't necessarily the only way or the one right way. That's fantastic. And that word mindful was, in my opinion, the most important piece of everything you just shared there. So if, yeah, if there's anything about this book um, that's sort of a consistent theme throughout, it's the importance of, of being mindful, of being reflective, of questioning everything from uh, the assumptions and beliefs 
that we begin with, um, questioning the goals that we set for ourselves. Uh, I think that, uh, especially as I've as I've sort of gotten older, I've been, I, you know, I've 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 realized more the importance of of metacognition, of thinking about thinking, of being able to sort of question ourselves, to be self aware, and you know, I, I bring that very much to this topic of planning. Okay, so that's awesome. Now I really want to dig into that because um, I, that is such an important. I don't even know what to call it aspect or virtue of a person uh, that I really do think think makes them more valuable in in everything that they do in their life. And so, you know, you're taking a, a, a lens of planning through that, right? So tell tell us a little bit more about how you dig into that, even maybe at a high level in the book. I mean, planning is what you know. What are the fundamentals of that for you? Yeah. So, um, I. I have a, a mnemonic or a memory device uh, that that basically, cr you know, creates the framework for the book. So the the mnemonic is is Starfinder, and uh, so there are four principles and six practices. The four principles are social, tangible, agile, and reflective. So I argue that. Uh, uh, you know, if we want to get better at planning, we should make planning more social and, you know, involve people early and often, more tangible, uh, get ideas out of our heads and into the world so we can see and share them. More agile, we need to plan for disruption, be prepared to learn and pivot, and then be more reflective, all right, question everything. So those are the four principles, and I think those apply throughout the process of planning. And then I identify six practices, uh, and it can help to think of them as phases, but it's important to keep in mind that planning is nonlinear. Uh, so this is the finder part of Starfinder, framing, imagining, narrowing, deciding, executing, and reflecting. Uh, and so, you know, that framework basically stretches out planning into a you know a sort of six practices or phases mm -hmm. and creates the opportunity to examine each one and think about okay how do i do that how might i do it better uh you know in a professional context or in a personal context yeah yeah okay so let's go through that just one more time the, the first part had uh had, you broke down into four pieces yeah, so the first part is star, social, tangible, agile, and reflective. And those are principles that apply throughout. Mm -hmm. And the second is the fi is finder, uh, framing, imagining, narrowing, deciding, executing, and reflecting. Okay. Acronyms are always helpful, and this is, this is getting into some really good stuff. At the tail end of that, you mentioned you know, not only how to apply this to our professional lives, but also our personal lives. Yeah. So throughout the book, I use, I draw stories from my personal life. Um, many of them, not necessarily the, the, the sort of hero success stories, but the slightly more embarrassing, <laughs> you know, things that didn't work out. Um, and, it, you know, but I talk about planning family vacations, um, uh, trying to climb a mountain and failing. Uh, and, and so, you know, for me, planning is something that, uh, you know, is part of my professional life, but I'm doing it all the time, uh, in, in my personal life. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's healthy to, uh, to, to kind of separate those two, too strongly. I think our culture has kind of created these artificial boundaries between work and life, uh, that, you know, don't recognize we're the same person <laughs> when yeah. we when we sort of get in the car and drive to work. We bring our whole selves with us, uh, and so you know that's another of my goals in, in in my writing is to sort of help people break down those boundaries and and bring our whole selves uh, uh, to work and to home. <laughs> that's very good. That's that's very insightful, and um, you know whether or not a lot of people want to accept it. That's very true. I mean, we are a whole person and often you know the the work we do in you know, quote unquote professional life is just simply another expression of how we fulfill our life or how we find fulfillment in our life right 
Absolutely. And I've been arguing in, in my most recent uh, conference presentations that uh, we need to think a lot more carefully about ethics with with that sort of context in mind. Uh, I think this this uh, this 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 excuse that, well, this is that's just business uh, uh, is a problem. Uh, and so I think bringing our whole selves to work recognizes that, you know, we are um, not just intellectual beings, but also emotional and moral beings. And we need to find ways to um, sort of be happy with ourselves, uh, given that. Yeah, you know, so I, I'm going to go on a little bit of a left turn here. But that's, again, I think that that's very genuine and insightful to call that out and to say also, I mean, my and this is my opinion, uh, that's just business is is sort of a bullshit scapegoat, right? Like, yep. I mean, it's it's one of those things that people like to say to tell themselves uh, that they don't need to be held accountable for action or change in the world. And that's just not true. And so thankfully, uh, I believe we are actually seeing a tide turning on that front. And we're seeing people uh, bring more meaning, personal meaning, you know, if we're going to continue with that analogy, personal meaning into their professional lives. Uh, very, very consciously, which I think is is an extraordinary thing. It will will literally help change the world. Absolutely, yeah, and I'm hopeful too. Awesome. All right. Well, getting a little bit back more onto topic, I'm curious. You know, uh, whether those of you out there listening are natural planners, as Peter is, or perhaps less so, <laughs> as as Peter is targeting in this book. Uh, I can imagine both sides of the fence sitting here and wondering: Is there a point where you overplan? Is there a point where you know, you apply maybe that that star finder principle uh, to a degree that that is just far too much. So it it's absolutely possible to overplan, and and many of us do that. Uh, uh, when I was first uh, first sort of in the business world, uh, kind of helping to to grow uh, a company in the nineteen nineties. I was one of those sort of project managers who tried to plan out everything, uh, you know, on day one. Uh, and then I was often frustrated that things didn't turn out as I, as I had expected. So I've, over the years, I've learned to be a lot more uh, of an improviser. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I would say that I was, I was, I'm sort of a natural born planner who in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, has consciously worked at getting better at improvising uh, because we live in a an unpredictable world with with uh, you know where disruption and change is inevitable, and so we each need to find our own balance of you know how much do I need to prepare um, uh, and 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 where is the right place to be ready to improvise and it depends on context. Uh, you know, one of the things that frustrates me in, in uh, big organizations at the moment is organizations that have kind of shifted to agile software development have often decided that everything now has to happen within a two-week <laughs> you know, sprint <laughs> cycle. Sure. And that's silly, right? Like, you know, there are certain things, uh, certain kinds of activities where, uh, you know, the agile model really works. And there are other activities that you know, that require longer time frames and, and sort of deeper research and understanding. And so, you know, finding that balance between planning and improvising depends on the, on the person or the team and the context. Yeah, that's, that, that's very, very beautifully said. Thank you for that. And, um, and that's kind of what I was getting at and asking you the question is like, how do you find that balance? Right. And I'm, I, I assume you, you discuss this in the book as well, but, uh, one of the things you said there, I think is absolutely right is, you know, it's funny too. I just wrote an article about this, uh, that, that products or I'm sorry, people are the secret to successful products, right? It's people that, that make beautiful designs, experiences, products and companies. Uh, and it's people understanding and serving other people that do that. And so it's also fun to me that you use this agile and agile because it's kind of like peanut butter, right? People love peanut butter. Uh, but you don't necessarily spread peanut butter on everything you eat, <laughs> right? Uh, and so you don't apply agile to everything you do. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so I think that is, we've seen a pendulum swing away from big requirements up front, big design up front, 
uh, very strongly in the agile and lean direction uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. And, and, and a lot of that is very healthy, right? Uh, big organizations were terribly over planning. Um, and, you know, so that swing has happened for a reason and there's a lot that, of good that's come out of it. But I think we, we, we need to swing back a little bit more uh, or at least recognize that, uh, you know, different kinds of activities and projects require a different balance between planning and improvisation. Yeah, no question. And, and th what you just said there too makes me think about, well, I guess the, th the thought that popped into my head is there's a, there's a balance to be struck between the three-year plan that some enterprise tries to create, mm -hmm. right? And the fail fast, fail often on everything you do startup mentality, which right. is we all know is false. And we've, we've beaten to a pulp on this podcast, so I won't necessarily, uh, you know, kick a man when it's down. Uh -huh. But it's interesting because I would love to hear, uh, particularly on your side of the world, right? Because you, you are a self-proclaimed natural planner. You used to plan everything and you've consciously actively worked uh, sort of against that. I I'm curious, tell us a little bit about your personal experience in going through that. Um, Let's see. So, you know, as I mentioned, I, I remember I remember well the early days of uh, of growing a company and and over planning, uh, and the frustration that I felt when things didn't go well uh, or or go according to plan. Um, you know, in in more recent years, I guess I've become more conscious of that you know distinction between planning and improvisation, and. You know, I find that <clears throat> this is an area that we we often tend to create these false dichotomies, right? So we we try to categorize people as, oh, I'm a planner and you're an improviser, and then we sort of we argue over what's better. Uh, hmm. And yet, yeah, so I I feel there's there's a line I use in um in my uh, the book I wrote before this one, uh, Intertwingled, mm -hmm. uh, and I sort of say we we. We use check boxes um, when uh, when sliders would be more appropriate, right? So mm -hmm. instead of sort of saying, "Are you a planner or an improviser?" Uh, you could imagine a, a slider where you sort of try to find, a, you know, here's where I am in the in the spectrum between plan planning and improvisation. So I've become more conscious that, you know, I don't. Um, I'm not always so careful with language. I don't think you know we can always um, police our language, but 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 when I think about it, uh, it it's it's better not to you know categorize ourselves and others um, you know as one or the other, mm -hmm. but to recognize that we we all are you know are at some point in that spectrum, and we can nudge ourselves one way or the other uh, depending on. Um, our strengths and weaknesses, and depending on you know where we think we might want to go for a particular context. That's you know that's a bombshell of knowledge that I think you just shared there, Peter. Because that's uh, it's actually poison to a lot of organizations. We have these masks that we expect people to wear, and uh -huh. uh, no gray area, and ne'er between the two shall meet, sort of thing, right? Uh, that's a really, really big deal. And, and a thought that's been going through my mind, particularly having conversations with, you know, leaders and luminaries like yourself on our podcast, as well as doing our own work here at Aurelius is what makes a successful product and experience in a company is a set of people who are all aligned behind the same goal and mission and aspiration who are just actively working on that together. And that, and that team, right, that is a team those people should be comprised of complementary skill sets, but not rigidly enforced separation of skill sets. Right. And that's so important because, you know, for us, uh, I will speak for myself and Joseph. We actually uh, just did, you know, our own podcast. We have a separate track of it called Inside Aurelius. And one of the things we talked about was uh, this importance for developers to care about, be involved in, and have a stake in user research. I mean, a, d a developer, an engineer, a technologist has the same amount of investment in serving customers well as a user experience professional does. Yep. But yet they often don't feel like they have license to be part of or call for or expect insights from research. And so 
you know, they don't, they don't necessarily act on that. You know, you have to, it's something that you have to fight for and advocate. I, as, as an information architect, very often when I start talking with a prospective client uh, and write up a proposal or a statement of work, I will propose, you know, some uh, uh, sort of uh, portion of, of sort of user research interviews of talking with their customers directly. And it's an area where quite often I get pushback. They will say, well, we already have a user experience team or a user research team, and, and we've got folks that have done that, and you can just look at that research. And you know, I say, well, that's great. You know, I, I want to. I definitely want to see what's already been done. Uh, but my, <clears throat> you know, first of all, there are there are questions uh, and hypotheses that I will want to explore as an information architect that are almost certainly different than what has already been explored uh, by the, the existing teams. And secondly. Um, I gain a huge amount of motivation, and and you know by actually directly talking with and observing uh, users, uh, by you know that that's that's how I build empathy uh, and motivation. So, you know, I, I think that whatever your role in the organization, just as as you said, you know, whether you're a developer or a content strategist or a designer, um, having some direct involvement in you know framing the user research uh, in doing the user research i think is incredibly valuable um, but organizations often set up these silos and the sort of the sense of turf that can make that difficult yes it's a big big deal you know having everybody who is connected to the customer you know i'll steal a quote from aaron walter who we recently had on the show um, and one of the things he said is, is that that connection to the customer throughout the company, that's a superpower. That's something that he and his team at Envision, you know, with the design education uh, team and the, and the design genome project they found is just, that's the thing that separates really exceptional design and product teams and engineering teams for that matter, yep. uh, as opposed to everybody else. But but yet here we are, Peter, you're finding this this pushback, even with somebody like yourself, who is a world renowned speaker, um, published author several times over uh, recommending this stuff. You know, I'm really curious and I got to imagine people who are listening to this conversation are asking as well. How does Peter then deal with that? Right. Like if, of anybody, you're somebody who should be able to manage this really, really well, being such a seasoned and uh, and uh, high level practitioner that you are. Yeah, and it depends on context. Sometimes I will push back right then and there and say, "No, we really, I really want to do some user research as part of this 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 initial phase." Um, and you know, and sometimes I'm successful in that. Other times I'll be patient and I'll say, "Okay, well, you know, why don't we during this phase, we'll you know, I'll meet with the user researchers and and we'll ask them to share what they've done so far, uh, and we'll we'll sort of identify gaps." Uh, you know, sort of between what, you know, what's the current state of, of knowledge about the customers and what's our sort of desired future state. And then in the next phase, if necessary, we'll do user research. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so I guess that's another thing that comes with uh, getting older is I've got a little bit more patience and, and, and uh, you know, I recognize that, uh, you know, if we're going to have that chance to move forward to a, a subsequent phase, we can kind of kind of do it then once once it's become completely evident that that there's stuff missing. Sure, sure. Well, and that's there's something uh, there's a nugget of very valuable information that you just shared there. Now, whether or not people really grasp that, I, I'm going to combine a couple different things here. So there's a, a quote from our one of our previous guests. Um, Peter Merholtz, as well as a quote from a talk I've been giving recently, right? So, so Peter told us on his episode that he takes this sort of lawyer-like approach to design. And that resonated with me because I always felt like I was very, you know, uh, objective and, uh, and presented the facts and laid out a case for that, right? And so he, that was beautiful language for me to resonate to. But one of the things that I've been sharing, Peter, in a talk that I've been giving recently called, on selling your ideas. And I get into selling research. The idea there is that you are not selling user research, right? You are not selling the activity of talking to people and gathering insights. 
what you are selling is confidence. You are selling answers to questions. And so it kind of sounds like to me, uh, and please keep me honest with this, that as you're negotiating and navigating these challenges, you're allowing people to find that they don't have all the information to make them feel confident in the decisions they're making. Yes. Um, I, one of the things that's interesting about, um, you know, being brought in as an expert, uh, you know, and, and, and I've seen, I've seen huge variation across organizational cultures. Some organizations are really expert cultures and they, they're looking for the expert to tell them, you know, the right way to do things. Yeah. Um, I feel uncomfortable in those uh, cultures. I can I can play that role if I have to, uh, but you know, the stuff that we're often dealing with is sufficiently new and complex that nobody really is an expert. <laughs> uh, you know, that nobody knows the the one right way to do something. And so I prefer cultures that are more kind of collaborative, where we're going to kind of figure out uh, the best answer that, you know, the best answer, come up with the best answer or solution that we can together. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, the sort of notion of, 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 of teams kind of working towards, uh, you know, a, a shared goal. Uh, and I, you know, the, the thing that, uh, one of the most valuable resources for me when I was doing research for the book uh, was a surprise. I found um, uh, that that the the uh, the Marines have uh, have published a a a a guide to planning. Right, the, the, this is how the Marines do planning, mm -hmm. and it's a you know it's a PDF. It's available for free on the on the web, and so I sort of stumbled upon this, and uh, you know. It, I would never have thought about it, but it, once I found it, it made sense, right? These folks are, uh, are sort of sending people into harm's way, into totally unpredictable situations. They need to have a really good plan, but they also need to be prepared to improvise. And so that's where the notion of commander's intent comes in, right? That yeah. we have a goal, we have a stated goal, like we wanna get on top of that hill, but we also understand the intent. Why do we want to get on top of that goal? Because if the you know if if something blocks uh, the original plan, we need to be prepared to improvise. But together, we can figure out a way to achieve the original intent. So you know, I think that that kind of collaborative approach of sort of saying we need to work together to sort of solve the problems as they arise. We know where we're headed, but um, you know, we also realize we may need to help each other uh, around obstacles. Oh, Peter, you are tugging at my heartstrings right now. This is awesome stuff. Uh, and again, I mean, selfishly, personally, because this is such a big deal to me, you are absolutely right. And I personally also study a lot of, you know, military history and culture and even follow some folks who are, are relatively on the forefront of those uh, lines right now, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> folks like Jocko Willink, right? And so he talks about this kind of thing. And yes, that manual you talk about, I think is very, very important. I'm going to take a step back, right? And, and just simply say something that we've stated on this podcast before, which is, you know, let's take a look at the work we do. Most of the time, most of us listening to this, we are doing work on apps, right? Web apps, websites, mobile apps. Mm -hmm. This is not mission critical stuff. But if we can take a page from the chapter of you know, the U.S. Marine Corps planning guide and maybe take one step, two step backward. We're actually in really, really good shape, right? And yep. the other thing there is uh, inherently in some of the things that you said, I would translate into the way that I talk about goals as well, which is, yes, here's our stated goal for a product and experience. But the way we abstract that, and, the, and we've written about this on the Aurelius blog, by the way, is you know, there's a goal statement, but then there are success indicators, which is the behavior we hope to elicit. And so then when you talk about that commander's intent, that's, that's the, you know, analog to those uh, success indicators for us because it's behavior, right? The, the goal statement can be vague and it's difficult sometimes to rally people behind that. But when we say, for instance, the goal statement is 
increase the number of people signing up for a free trial of our software or product. Fine. The success indicators are the behavior that will express whether or not we're meeting that goal, such as people hitting our signup page, people filling out our form, people actually using <laughs> our product in a free trial, right? Um, now, all of a sudden, we have something a little bit more tactile to hang our hat on. As you mentioned, uh, uh, overcoming that hill or, or I've never been in the military, so I can't say appropriately, <laughs> right? But like, but like achieving that goal, that aim, and it allows you to improvise and, and do so appropriately in your context, which we all are being called on to do every day. Yep. Although I'm going to push back on one thing, which is, um, you know, so you, you know, success indicators or metrics, I agree that it's important to have them, but we also need to be incredibly careful uh, to not, uh, you know, sort of uh, become too attached to any particular set of indicators. Um, you know, I think of Wells Fargo, for instance, that had some strong metrics uh, tied to, you know, how they were incentivizing folks, uh, and it got them in a lot of trouble. So, um, you know, metrics are important, but quite dangerous. Yeah, no, totally. Well, interestingly enough, Peter, you and I agree uh, more than you maybe realize. So success indicators and metrics are all part of creating a good product or experience goal for me. So because the success indicators are purely based on human behavior, uh, and then the metrics express an objective, you know, binary, okay. yes, no measurement of those behaviors. And then what you've got is you've got the goal statement, you've got success indicators or behavior and then metrics that measure that and i argue that the ch you know the challenge there is that uh, i'm sure you face you face this as well yourself oftentimes we're given metrics we want to improve page right. count sign up count uh, whatever and we you know you, you and i both know there's a lot of dark patterns um not great ways we can do uh to affect those metrics Yep. But the behaviors, so that's where we all meet in the middle, right? That's where us as designers, engineers, even business leaders all agree, this is the behavior that we want to elicit from our customers, right? And so then if we can all agree on that middle piece, then the metric should move and then the more abstract goal statement should be met. Sounds good. Well, good. Wow, <laughs> I've, I've never had that easy, easy of an argument. But also, you're 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 a brilliant mind in our field, so uh, so that would make sense that you get that. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so tell us a little bit more. And you know, even before I go any further, Peter, you mentioned your your prior book, Intertwingled, which I read and I found very very important. And it's it was funny to me, not funny, but interesting that you mentioned um, your upcoming book was your attempt at more of a general audience. Um, I would hope you take this as a compliment. I think Intertwingled was absolutely an important book for a general audience to understand the interconnectedness of all things and the work that we do and how, you know, even using your words, that mindfulness can help us be better. Yeah, I think um, I think of Intertwingled as um, not necessarily being limited to a, you know, UX or technology audience, but there are certain limiting factors in in taking a sort of a systems thinking approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, systems thinking. There were these brilliant people back in the '70s and '80s, kind of you know exploring this whole notion of of complex adaptive systems, and uh, you know they did they achieved some degree of of success in terms of spreading their ideas, but but it never really stuck. Right, you don't have a lot of you know you know university departments of systems thinking. Um, if you stop your average person on the street and, and ask them, do you know what systems thinking is? They'll say, nope, I have no idea. <laughs> um, sure. And you know, I think that um, systems thinking and information architecture um, both share uh, the fact that that they're 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 sort of asking of people to uh, to kind of go to a level of depth, complexity, you know, to kind of become abstract, uh, to think, uh, you know, more of of sort of systems and and sort of consequences and and sort of you know longer term. A lot of folks just just sort of just kind of like uh, run away from that, right? Like, like no, thank you. Yeah. Um, so there is a self-limiting aspect to Intertwingled, um, but you know, at the same time, one of the things that, that I think is 
is is nice about it is it, it attracts people from a really wide range of backgrounds who who are drawn to that more kind of systems thinking kind of how are things connected way of of approaching the world definitely and that's and that's definitely the place where i would agree with you um that that's the you know the middle ground or the more general audience that should accept and absorb the insights that you shared in your book Intertwingled. Um, I love the fact that you you know directly call out the fact that it is systems thinking. It's it's a matter of considering the actions that are in my sphere of influence and the second and even third degree effect of what I do there. Yep. The um. You know, one of the stories I tell in there is the uh, the, the origin of the term cobra effect, uh, where in uh, in in colonial India, uh, the the British who were running the show for a time, uh, they didn't like all the big poisonous snakes, right? Uh, and so they 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 put a bounty on on cobras and said, you know, well, you know, for every dead cobra you bring us, we'll give you uh, a small amount of money. And, uh, you know, so the, you know, if you just looked at the first order effect, you would say, oh, great plan. You're going to get rid of the cobras. Uh, but of course, uh, some of the smart uh, Indian folks uh, uh, basically built cobra breeding farms <laughs> and started breeding cobras so they could bring them in <laughs> and get money. Uh, and once the British kind of caught on to this, they said, that's it. You know, no more money for snakes, and so of course the the cobra farmers released all their snakes, and so you know you basically had you know a far worse problem than you started with. Right. Um, and there are examples today of the same kinds of things going on in yeah. our world. Um, so yeah, just just even even thinking a little bit about the possible second and third order effects, we can't predict um, reliably. But we can certainly, you know, spend a little time brainstorming and thinking, and and maybe anticipating some of the worst backlashes. Yes, absolutely. And so, Peter, this is very special because I think it's really distilling down a lot of our conversation to, you know, and this is one of the things I try to do on our podcast is bring people back to what can you do tomorrow, right? So people are sitting there, um, and there are folks listening to our podcast. They're product leaders. They're UX designers. They're researchers. And they're going to say, okay, well, how can I be more mindful? How can I bring that, that consideration and mindfulness of second and third degree you know, impacts to my work tomorrow? How can I get there? I'm curious, you know, do you have advice to share for these people who are thinking about how they can help do that and help literally change the world in small steps even tomorrow when they wake up? So one... You know, when I think about myself as a as a as a kid and and even sort of a teenager or twenty something, my sort of mental model of how I was back then versus how I am now is that I was sort of wearing blinders, right? I just I saw kind of a narrow slice um, of the world, and and I I feel like uh, you know as I sort of moved uh, through my forties, uh, I've I've sort of been able to take the blinders off a little bit. Um, some of that I think just takes time, <laughs> um, but I would say that meditation, not just meditating, but also reading and thinking about meditation has been very helpful uh, in becoming a little bit more self-aware. Uh, and so, you know, that would be one thing I would recommend is some kind of mindfulness practice uh, uh, to, to sort of start moving forward in that area. Awesome. You know, and I personally, as a, uh... Yeah, whatever. I'm not wild about the term, but as an entrepreneur myself, um, I've, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and, and, and kind of consume a lot of information where people espouse this, right? This idea of meditation and mindfulness uh -huh. uh, in order to outwardly express your intentions in a more meaningful way. I think that that's very, very useful. Um, what about those people who are not necessarily as receptive to that idea to meditation and being more in tune with their thoughts. I mean, is there something they can do in their day-to-day -day lives, right? That, that maybe is not an actual 10, 15, 30 minute break of meditation that will help them even for a moment, pause to consider 
what effect this has beyond my decision here and now? Yeah, I think uh, I, I would. Act, so in, in those four principles, uh, social, tangible, agile, and reflective, uh, the first two really are the ones that, that, that may come easiest to people. Um, so, you know, with social, uh, involve people early and often in your planning. Uh, you know, one of the one of the biggest mistakes we make with planning is we procrastinate. You know, it, it feels a little heavy. We're a little worried about it, and so we hold we hold off, and then we start too late. Uh, just sort of inviting someone into a conversation, sort of saying, you know, hey, would you just talk with me about this for five or ten minutes? Uh, kind of helps develop that comfort level. Uh, you know that okay, now now that I've actually started thinking about this, I'm kind of excited and I want to push forward. Um, but also inviting other people to participate in in a planning activity will will help you become more aware of uh, you know possible consequences or what you might think of as externalities, right? You sort of realize, oh, this is going to affect other people that I hadn't been thinking of so far. Yeah. Um, and then the second principle, tangible, right? Starting to sketch your ideas out, drawing a timeline or a map. Um, you know, making our ideas tangible can also uh, make us a little bit more aware of, you know, uh, you know, how might this affect others? Uh, you know, I, I sort of, I encourage people to draw the system and then draw the system outside the system, right? What are you leaving out in your map? Uh, I think that is a, is a, you know, something that we can always use to, to kind of broaden the way we're thinking about uh, something. Yeah, no, that's it. so. That's a, a really big deal too, because I I couldn't agree more. Where you know you're sitting here and you're trying to plan this stuff out. I think that there's an expectation that okay, whoever's making the plan has all the answers. And I, it sounds like you are as well. And again, please keep me honest, Peter. Um, I advocate for creating the plan, even if it's a design or experience or product plan, and presenting that and bringing it with you know socializing it as you would say earlier and saying you know what we don't know we're bringing this to you because you're a bunch of smart folks who are all trying to accomplish the same thing help us find the blind spots and the gaps and let's get to that point faster together rather than relying on one central point of failure as the military actually would say right and even in the US Marine Corps planning manual Absolutely. Um, you know, in the book, I talk about planning family vacations. Uh, I talk about one vacation that I planned. Uh, I thought it all went well. Uh, we went to St. Thomas in the Caribbean. Uh, my goal with this vacation was, hey, let's have a really relaxing time, you know, be at the beach, go snorkeling. Um, I kind of, you know, classified it as a big success. But months later, I heard from our teenage daughters that they were bored, <laughs> you know. Um, and so in, in the next vacation I planned, we, we ended up going uh, to Belize. Uh, I talked with them early and often about what do you want from this vacation? And they were really clear. They wanted adventure. Mm. So we ended up doing this crazy cave expedition uh, in search of uh, Mayan uh, uh, pot, you know, ancient Mayan pottery and skulls from child sacrifices. We went swimming with sharks. Uh, <laughs> you know, we did some really adventurous stuff. Some of it was a bit scary, um, but you know, they had a, the greatest time. And and so for me, that was a great example of you know, my default had been okay. I'm the dad. I'm going to plan the vacation, and um, you know, I th I thought about other people, you know, and, and what they would enjoy. Sure, but I didn't ask them, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I've gotten better at that. Yeah, no, I, and that's just. I mean, it's such a a beautiful and human example of how you can connect with this, right? So for people who are out there who have kids and maybe the primary caregiver of that, and regardless of the role you play in that relationship right it's like you're absolutely right there's some expectation on me that i'm supposed to figure it all out but in reality the only way you know quote unquote you figure it all out is by including the people that you're trying to serve in that process of planning yep and one of the things i've been uh, arguing recently in my conference talks is um that it's really good to you know when you when you have an opportunity to build your team to you know to sort of 
decide who to include in that planning process, it's really good to include people with different backgrounds and perspectives. Um, the way I phrase it is um, diversity is a cure for unpredictable adversity, right? Because with people with different perspectives and backgrounds may, f may have a, you know, see a different way around those obstacles as they arise. Yeah, well, that's ever more important than it has been in the society and the world we live in now, which is, yes, they are blind spot indicators. Yep. Right? Is where this is something I believe, this is something I know, and and there's a relative truth there, and relative being the operative term, right? Um, until you are exposed to this adverse, um, uh, un, un understood uh, perspective or set of views that your your work and your perspective only improves. Yeah, I think many of us have have maybe sort of had an instinctual or sort of natural appreciation for diversity, whether it's biological diversity or diversity in a human context. But now we're being forced to to be more explicit in arguing why <laughs> diversity is a positive thing. Certainly. Well, and I would I would tie it back to something that you you know, introduced in this conversation, that, that idea of mindfulness. And that's why that was such a big deal for me, where uh, the simple act of choosing to be more mindful of yourself and your actions beyond your sphere of influence, I think is a very, very big deal. Yep. What, what I like to say is there are no externalities. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, a big concept to, to, to think about. It's a lot of responsibility that we have, but um, you know, we affect the, the entire world uh, with all of our actions. Certainly. And I think that that's an important thing for all of us listening to this podcast who make things for other human beings is worthwhile to consider. Uh, Peter, this has been such a delightful conversation with you, but I realize we're running up to the end of our time. I'm curious, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience that we haven't discussed today or, you know, other places they can find you and your work? So I'll, 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 I'll make one pitch uh, uh, related to my book that may be interesting to your audience, given that this is a podcast. Um, I heard from some folks uh, several weeks back. Uh, they were saying, when is the audible version of your book coming out? I'm too busy to read books. <laughs> uh, and so I'm really happy to say that within the next few weeks, the audible version uh, of planning for everything should be available. And so those folks who uh, commute back and forth to work and, and listen to books uh, uh, will be able to, to, to do so. Yeah, awesome. Well, I would, I would hope and expect that all those people who are too busy to go ahead and read that book also are listening to our podcast. If they're not, then you folks need to get on that and then also yeah. need to get on to Peter's audio book coming up. Sounds good. Fantastic. And if anybody wants to get in touch with you or learn more about you, Peter, where should they go? Uh, semanticstudios.com or intertwingled.org. Awesome. And intertwingled, uh, this was not something that Peter asked me to do. This is of my own volition. Intertwingled was a fantastic book that I think is applicable to anybody living their lives in the world we are in today, but more specifically, people who are doing stuff in the digital world for who knows, countless others. Um, it's a very big deal. Read that book, and I think that will help change your perspective. and bring that mindfulness to what you're trying to do. Peter Morville, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed talking with you and uh, thank you for having me. Fantastic. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to Aurelius Podcast, talking about product strategy and design strategy. We are the first platform of its kind to help you solve the right problems for your customers and your business and build products and services that truly matter. You can check us out at AureliusLab.com. That is www.aureliuslab.com. You can check us out on Twitter at AureliusLab and Instagram 
Aurelius Lab. We'll see you next time.